Welcome to episode 120 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. My name is Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up at the night sky. And this podcast is for anyone else who likes going out under the stars. How was your week, Shane? It was pretty good, Chris. How was yours? Oh, hanging in there. We had a little bit of wet weather, finally. Yeah, much needed. It's been so dry around here. It's nice to get a lot of rain and You know, I think it's a good timed rain as far as the farmers go. I think a lot of them were able to get their seed into the ground. And now, you know, I guess it's May showers bring June flowers. I don't know. Maybe. I was almost to the point of saying, you know what, just just for the crops, I'm going to buy a telescope so that it will rain. (laughs) <laughs> we didn't get to that point here though, but man, it, it was so dry. So it was so, how dry was it? It was so dry that, uh, I'd gone out to observe once and didn't cause the dust was just, it's, it was starting to blow around in the field like snow. <laughs> so yeah. 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 It, uh, I don't, I think we probably set some records actually, I think for the least amount of rainfall during whatever period of time it was, it was, or or not even just rainfall, but moisture in general. uh, Yeah, it was dry. And then, so this, this is the weird part and where we live uh, weather wise is a very strange place. So we'd been having uh, 32 degrees uh, plus Celsius. I don't don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but that's hot. Um, During the day, we had several days of this uh, in a row and then uh, it was forecast to snow. And it's sort of a strange thing to think about because we're not living at the top of a mountain or anything here. We're just, we're just in a huge plain. And, uh, and then, yeah, it, uh, over the course of 24 hours, the weather continually to get cold. And then at noon on Thursday, we had uh, about a, a centimeter of slush on the ground and it was snowing pretty hard. <laughs> Yeah, if, if there's one thing you can count on in this province, it's that the May long weekend has at least a 50% chance of rain and snow. And I think it's even a, a higher probability than that. It just seems like that weekend because it's the first weekend when our provincial parks open. Uh, I remember like going back to when I was a kid that that weekend was just infamously poor weather. And uh, it, it held true again this year. It didn't disappoint that way. Yeah. I think one of my coworkers is mad at me though, because I had taken off uh, a week, a few weeks back, and then she was taking off um, this weekend and the coming week. And and so she wrote to tell me that she wouldn't be around or whatever. So I wrote back and said, fingers crossed that the snow sticks around and you can go sledding. She never replied. So <laughs> <laughs> I think she was really bitter about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I can understand. <laughs> yeah. You get your, you get some binoculars. You were holding out on me. I was. Yeah. Well, and there's a reason for, for keeping them a secret. Um, because you didn't want me to swoop in and buy them. I know. I know. No, no. Because I was quite sure I was getting swindled or not receiving what I thought I was going to receive because the deal just seemed too good to be true. Um, so what it, what it is or what I ended up with is a, a pair of seven by 35 Bushnell Rangemaster binos. Mm. And um you know, this kind of falls in line with our, like what you and I have talked about lots in terms of those uh, older vintage uh, binoculars that are seven by 35 and extremely wide field. They just mm-hmm. don't really make them anymore. But, you know, in the fifties and sixties, and even I think somewhat in the seventies, uh, that was a fairly common binocular actually. Um, and there's varying levels of quality amongst them. In fact, most of them have, uh, you know, pretty diminishing fields uh, towards the edge, you know, where the stars really get aberrated and it's just not a, you know, you may have a a 10 or 12 degree field of view, but the outer 20 to 30% isn't very good, but there is a small handful of these old binoculars where the majority of the field is usually pretty sharp. And uh, you picked up a pair recently that falls into that category. And then another one is these Bushnell Range Masters. Um, mm-hmm. And there's, there's a few different versions of the Range Masters. The, uh, the best ones are made by, I think, Fuji, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, I did not range. get one of those pair. Um, I, the you know, I, yeah, I got the Tamrons. Yeah. And then there's two Tamrons. There's the Custom and then there's the Transition. And I think I, I think the transition is the more popular one. And that's yeah. the one I ended up with, or, or maybe not even popular, just more numerous. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I got these things for $50 Canadian, wow. which really is quite a steal. Like if you look these things up on uh, eBay, I think they typically go for, 
I don't know, 250 to 300 US. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. But. Yeah. Yeah. They, and, and, you know, it's weird. I also got mine for a lower price um, when I got mine there uh, last month, I think. And, mm-hmm. and I ended up paying, I think I paid $83 American for mine. And again, typically those ones hit. And I assumed just like you, that I was going to be on the bad end of a deal. And I'll tell you, like they're, the, the cosmetics on, on all but the glass are, are B minus. Um, actually, I really don't care about that. I, I kind of, in fact, I kind of like that. I like the fact that they look like they've really lived a life. Like people use yeah. them yeah. and love them. And I think for good reason. And the optics are totally aligned and in perfect condition. So I'm, I'm uh, happy with them. And, and yours, how do they fare? Uh, really good. Yeah. The, um, what's interesting is with my glasses on, I felt like the collimation was just a touch off. But, you know, the eye relief on these things are, are not very good on these old wide fields. That's the one downfall. Yeah. Um, so to see the whole field, I have to take my glasses off anyway. And yeah. uh, with my glasses off, it, they're fine. Like, I don't have any collimation issues at all, which is, I, you know, I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, maybe my, my eyes or my brain can just merge the images better without the glasses. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Hard, hard to say. Yeah, it's probably something something with that. They're just not designed for using with with your eyes set back so far. So, um, yeah, yeah. Something's probably not right. Yeah. yeah the, uh, so I, I had a brief, so, you know, we just talked about all this rain and snow that we're experiencing, which means bad, bad observing weather. Um, but at the start of all of this, uh, so last Monday, uh, was our last clear night of the week and I was out, it was quite windy. Um, so it was actually a really good binocular night. I wouldn't take a telescope out in that wind. And, mm. uh, because I just, uh, had a, had received these range masters. Uh, I took them out and, uh, checked out Mercury. Cause it was, uh, I think that was the highest point in the sky that Mercury will be at. I yep. looked at the moon, looked at uh, various star fields and, and kind of panned the sky just to give these things a, a good go around. How are the edges? And not the best, you know, I yeah. would say like the outer five to 10% are utterly trash. Like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't think you can really discern much, uh, there. And I, you know, I would estimate that the, the breakdown starts at about 65 to 70% of the way out. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then, and then it's, it's kind of gradual, right. From that point, but like you hit that like 90% wall and it's a cliff. Like you just, the, the image is gone. So um, are they just, is it just out of focus or what's happening there? Uh, so up to about 90%, it's just more out of focus, like kind yeah. of field curvature. It looks like more than anything. Uh, but then that outer edge is just like, I can't explain it. It, it literally disappears almost like it just, like it just washes away. Huh? That, that is what I'd almost prefer over what mine do. <laughs> oh, what, what do yours do? So I think mine have like, um, well, like you're getting out into very severe sphere collaboration and, uh, and just the distortion, like the star, the stars are so stretched by the time oh. you get to 90%. It, it reminds me of a pretty decent time exposure of Polaris and how the stars are like, so if you did like, oh, yeah. a, like maybe like a five minute exposure of Polaris or maybe 10 minutes, those stars on the edge of the field of say like a 50 millimeter lens are what my stars look like. Like they're really, it's pretty crazy. Like actually, I'm not sure. I got to, I got to get them down to a dark sky and see how they are in the Milky Way. I'm actually not sure if I'll be able to use them. I'm not sure how people do. And, and it could be my eye too, because uh, I should be wearing glasses because I have astigmatism and maybe that's just compounding what I'm seeing. Um, but it, it's pretty ridiculous. So I'm not sure if, if I can actually use them. So. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's been my experience with every pair of these old school wide field binoculars is like the outer edge is just, and it's more than 10% in a lot of the ones that I've looked at, like it's the outer 30 or 40% almost Yeah, is like, you, you can see like the rounding of those star trails. Like it's just bizarre. And it, it's so distracting that like, why even have that field or why have the field that wide when it's so poor, you know, just shrink it and and show me what you know the glass can actually achieve so i gotta Um, i gotta come back and say that um again um you know it's kind of neat to have the wide field view but i still love my uh, pentax 7 by 35s uh modern day action extreme is what it's called and i think man those are still such great binoculars pentax or nikon uh sorry they're nikon did i say right yeah 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 okay good stuff and you got an eyepiece too, I see. 
I did. Um, well, I haven't received it yet, but I won an auction. So, um, you know, I've been trying to put together a, a, a small set of eyepieces to use with a vinyl viewer, and I want them to be minimal glass eyepieces like orthos or super monos or whatever I can get my hands on. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got, or I, I won an auction for my second nine millimeter Pentax SMC ortho. Um, so I'm excited to receive that. So now I have, um, if I start at the high end, I have the 25 millimeter uh, 0.965 Takahashi orthos, the MCs. Uh, so I have a pair of those. I have a pair of the 18 millimeter Pentax SMC orthos, and now this nine millimeter pair. And between yeah. those three hey, focal lengths, hey, hey, uh, hey, I got a question for you, Shane. I'm cutting, I'm cutting Shane off here. This isn't in yeah, the script, yeah. but you've got a, a quite a few sets of 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 eye pieces here. That's that's cool. That's yeah. cool. What what bino viewer do you have? Well, that <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, that that. <laughs> That's one small technicality here in this whole, <laughs> in this whole arrangement of vinyl viewing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so there's a bit of a story there. Um, so <laughs> there's a, there's an astronomy friend that I have out east that um, uh, I've talked about a few times, and uh, he is starting to like reduce the size of his astronomy collection because he's uh, he's getting up in age. He's 79 years old. He's not using it all. Um, and just wants to, you know, reduce some of the clutter around the house. And anyway, selling a bunch of stuff. He's committed to selling me uh, a pair of um, uh, Dank- a Dankmeyer vinyl viewer. I'm not even sure which one, if it's like the Dankmeyer 2 or the original or what. There's a, yeah. there's a bunch of revisions of them. Um, but he bought it, I think, like for the, uh, the 2004 Mars opposition. So I think mm. the newest they could be would be like Dankmeyer 2s, but mm. I'm, again, not sure. So anyway, he lives in Ontario. And for those in Canada, you're probably aware, but everybody else probably not. Uh, that province has been under like a stay-at-home COVID lockdown or advisory for quite a while now. Um, so Tony can't get them out of his house at this moment. Um, so it's really just a waiting game. And he also has some health issues. So certainly don't want him taking any risks of mailing me, you know, vinyl viewers. I, I can certainly be patient and wait for them. Um, so anyway, my plan around this was just to slowly acquire some eyepieces uh, to, you know, uh, so that I'm ready when the vinyl viewer shows up. Mm-hmm. Cool. So there you go. Now, part of me, like, I really, really am intrigued by the uh, Bader Max Bright twos. Um, you know, the, the, the unreasonable side of my brain is telling me to buy the baiters. Um, and then, you know, when I get the Danks, uh, I can compare both sets and determine which one I like and keep that one. But that seems awfully excessive and unnecessary. So, uh, yeah. I don't know. But what I like about the vinyl viewers, uh, from Bader is, is the eyepiece holder is like the, it's the click lock that you and I really like, oh, which yeah. makes, you know, which makes swapping eyepieces so much nicer, quicker, yeah. easier, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I'm really drawn to it. And, you know, I have a bunch of other Bader diagonals and, you know, all of them mate together really well to reduce your light path, which is super important when you're vinyl viewing. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for me to go in the Bader direction, um, but we'll see where I end up. Yeah, um, I think we should yeah. get Bader to sponsor the show and, and we'll, we'll promote the hell out of their absolute cheapest product. <laughs> well, you, well, you, you know what Bader would say is, uh, why would we sponsor you guys when you do that already? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But that, that click clock, I got to say out of, out of all, you know, typically, typically almost with any accessory that I've ever used, it receives uh, less and less use over time. And and the best ones still get used from, from time to time, no matter what it is. Um, but I'll tell you that Bader click clock, that is the best accessory I ever bought for a telescope. It is ridiculously good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. We, we concur on that one. I, I do love it. It really works well. Yeah. You just got to sort out which one fits your, your telescope, but uh, yeah, every, everything that I have eventually will be Bader click lock that that's, that's happening in the future. Um, I have one now and have carded around a bit, but I'm going to, I'm going to put on everything. I think it's, it's the, the best invention that nobody had ever really thought up so much that, that works so well, just super, mm-hmm. super slick. Hard to describe how, how it works. It just kind of twist on, twist off, and that that would that's what allows you to um, change your diagonal eyepieces, change the angle of things. 
that are in your diagonal. Um, and it's so, uh, I used to hate how much and how frequently my diagonals would rotate and stuff. And when I'm, when I'm using one of my telescopes without it, I, I don't enjoy the experience as much. It, it just makes the telescope work better. And whatever it was, I think it was $55 or something like considering how good it is, it's and how much I use it and enjoy it when I use it. It's really surprising that I think it's one of the cheapest accessories. And I thought when I was paying that, I thought, oh, this is going to be low quality or it's going to be okay. I thought it would be futzy, but it's not. It actually makes observing easier and the quality build on it. Like I put it on my Takahashi and it's right up there with like, pen, it like put my Pentax eyepiece in my diagonal and it almost like matches sort of the the pentax sort of gray black gray uh motif and rubber yeah very nice well if the rubbers match you know what, what other choice do you have <laughs> yeah so what are you going to observe with the bun of your well everything um but i've been reading <laughs> <laughs> to, like I, I think that the conception around bino viewers is they're only good for planets in the moon because bino viewers dim your view and um that's a true statement. They do reduce the light. Um, uh, it's about a, uh, by a factor of a half a magnitude. Um, and, you know, people, and, and I've noticed this, like I've had vinyl viewers in the past and I've noticed like when I was looking at Saturn, Titan was uh, more difficult to detect in the vinyl viewer, whereas going mono viewing, it was bang, like it was there and it was no problem. Um but what is sometimes I think missed or overlooked with a bino viewer is while you get a reduction in magnitude uh, through it, you get an increase in the signal to noise ratio, meaning like the, the contrast and the detail that you see by, so you lose 0.5 of magnitude and you gain a 0.4 factor in, in signal to noise. I've mm -hmm. been reading all sorts of stuff about bino viewing and, and uh, the science behind it and uh, was quite intrigued recently about some of this stuff. Um, so, you know, a bino viewer, people often report being able to see far greater detail, not just mm -hmm. in the planets, but also deep sky objects. Mm. Um, and also like more color fidelity within like say Jupiter or stars mm. uh, and even some nebula. Um, now, you know, another conception uh, around bino viewers is that you really need to use them with a large aperture telescope, you know, like a big Newtonian or a big Cassegrain. Because yeah. you have that light loss, the big aperture sort of overcomes it and, you know, they, they still maintain their usability. Um, but, you know, what, what again, or again, what I found when I was reading, and this actually ties back to my presentation that I gave a couple of weeks ago about using small refractors, is the biggest mistake I made with small refractors early on is that I tried to use it like I used my big Newtonians, you know, like I was trying to look at faint galaxies with an 80 millimeter refractor. And that was just silly of me. Same thing applies to bino viewers. Mm. They work great. From what I read in smaller instruments, you just have to cater the objects that you're looking at to the instrument that you're using. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that to me, you know, I, I, I've learned that lesson now, you know, prior to this, but it just makes so much uh, sense uh, that you do the same thing with a bino viewer. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, I was reading um, a guy that had, now this, you know, this kind of contradicts me a little bit, but a guy with a 30 inch Newtonian who, um, <laughs> almost exclusively bino views, uh, his... me, What's that? you're killing me. Yeah, Is that no, next? No. I hope you get the 30 inch job. Next. Oh, no, 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 no. That is not on the radar. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, he was saying like when he's going for faint deep sky objects, um, like he's often able to like what he can detect with averted vision mono viewing, he sees with direct vision bino viewing. Mm. Um, and he attributes that to the, the signal to noise uh, increase that you get with the bino viewer. Um, so he said, if he's looking for like add objects on the threshold, for sure, bino viewing. And, um, you know, I think he's actually, I think he was almost exclusively a bino viewer. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, I'm excited to get this thing because, uh, you know, when I did have two things stand out for me when I did have that bino viewer and I just, you know, I had a Dankmeyer 27, which is like the newest one. And, you know, it's a really good bino viewer. I didn't really use it enough. And then I just sold it. And, uh, I do regret that a bit. Um, but two things stand out for me when I was using it. Um, one is obviously the comfort, you know, just being able to use two eyes instead of one. Like you don't get any fatigue really at the telescope. Whereas, you know, 
observing a couple of hours mono viewing, you're, at least for me, my eye kind of tuckers out after a little while. And, um, you know, I think that, that I start to see a little bit less as the night goes on. Yep. Um, but the other thing that stands out with using two eyes is like the image scale really jumps, like it really increases. So like the size of Jupiter, um, at the same magnification, you know, say mono viewing compared to bino viewing, it just appears larger, uh, bino viewing. And, um, you know, that, that is a more pleasing view in my mind and allows you to see more. Hmm. So very cool. I'll, I'll get off my soapbox for bino viewing and, uh, <laughs> wait for a bino viewer to show up, I guess. Yeah. Very good. Very good. How's the uh, custom wood tripod legs? Well, so I think that that project may be over before it begins. Oh sadly. no! <laughs> oh no! Well, I so I, you know, I I wanted to price things out first just to see you know what my cost input would be. Yeah. Uh, compared to just buying a, a Burla back, right? Yeah. And um, it would have to be a pretty substantial savings because the Burla back, you just know that that thing's going to be perfect and it's going to work and there's no yeah. issues. Whereas if I make something you know, maybe my cutting tolerances, you know, whatever, maybe, maybe I just don't do it quite right. And then I have to, you know, live with something that either doesn't work as well as it should, or I have to continue modifying or tinkering away to, to perfect it. Um, so anyway, um, the wood is uh, quite expensive you know, for anybody that's doing, you know, renovations, I think in North America, or at least Canada and the U S right now, probably knows this, that like the cost of wood in the last 12 months has gone up like three or four or 500% in some cases. Yeah. Um, because people are just doing so much home renos during this pandemic. Uh, the supply and demand just isn't quite adding up. Yeah. So um, anyway, just the wood for the tripod legs was probably going to run me 250 to $300. Yeah. You know, and then I need to buy like a tripod spreader, some sort of feed for the leg, you know, some other like, uh, you know, metal components to, you know, either have a clamping system or, you know, just to attach the legs to the tripod. There'd be all sorts of smaller miscellaneous uh, costs. So my guess would be that, you know, if I built it right without having to rebuy wood, cause I made a bad cut, you know, or any of that sort of stuff, I'd probably be into it for four to $500. Yeah. And, you know, the Burla back that I want is probably about 750. So that's just not a substantial enough savings. Cause one other factor is I would have to buy a couple of tools just to help finish the wood. Cause I just don't have them. Yeah. Um, now that's okay. If I'm going to make five or 10 or how, you know, multiple of sets of legs. Um, but that's just not in my future. So the input cost would be pretty large and, uh, I don't think it's the right project right now. Maybe if the wood prices come back to earth at some point or, or you know, go back to where they used to be, um, I, I might attempt it. Uh, the other thing is, I, I guess I could look at some cheaper woods. Um, I was looking at ash exclusively, and ash is not the, the cheapest of woods out there. So perhaps I settle for pine or something else. Well, I'm certainly not going to go against this green because I'm going to say, <laughs> just go with the pearl <laughs> back. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's definitely the, the easy way. Um, what are you looking yeah, at? Yeah. The uni uh, 19? One of the unis, yeah, the 18 or the 28. I like the 28 for how high it goes, but because I sit down all of the time or most yeah. of the time, I don't know how important, you know, having a six foot high tripod is. So. Yeah, that's, that's what I did with mine. I'm still, uh, still kind of working it through, but my, I have a, uh, an extension coming from First Light Optics over in the UK. And a, and a couple of rails. And once that comes, then get a better feeling for it. Um, ho hoping it comes through and, and works out right. But, uh, but yeah, so far so good on the, the couple of occasions I've had it out. It's, it's awesome. Like it, it works so well. Like you think it's a tripod, but, but I mean, and it is, but it just, you know, just everything from the spring loaded, um, you know, a screw uh, that, that you put into the, I forget what it's called, but anyway, the screw that goes into the bottom of your, of your mount or, or extension or whatever you're putting on um, just the way that whole thing works, you know, it just centers every time. So you're not, you know, it always seems like that's always a bit of a futzy thing when you get out in the field and you're trying to line that up. And it just, every time I drop it on, it just threads right in. It's just beautiful. And then just the way that like it, it spreads and, you know, 
yeah, just works better than advertised is, is what it breaks mm-hmm. down to really, really nice. So yeah, mm-hmm. you, you're, you're, what would happen? What I was worried would happen is, and I bought like this really basic low end one. And I thought if you make one and spend all this time and money, we're going to get into the field and you're going to take one look at mine and go, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> cause yeah. there's no way. There's no way that just somebody that's not like a pro woodworker is going to come out with anything even remotely as good. Yeah. Cause, cause the other thing with the burla back is like the fit and finish, right? Like cutting wood, you know, that, that is the easy part and that I'm not too scared of, but it's like, you know, the little spring loaded thing you were talking about and um, you know, just some of the, the way the, the legs lock on the burla back, like there's a lot of little things like that, that just make the function so nice. And that's to replicate that. Like you can buy all of those burla back parts. Um, like they sell everything individually. So if you want to yeah. repair your burla back or probably make a tripod, you can, but like, if you're going to that trouble and, and that expense, you know, again, why don't you just buy it from them and be done with it? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it, 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 it's a nice deal and lighter than I thought the chair was a little heavier than I thought it would be and the tripod's a little lighter. So that's sort of yeah. break, balance is owned. Even. Yeah. Break, yeah. breaking even on it. And as well, if you go with the lower tripods, they're, they're the lower their tripods are, it seems like the, uh, the weight almost increases the carrying capacity increases exponentially. So they're lighter yeah, they're weight. Can, yeah. Have a higher load and more stable. So yeah. yeah. Cool. So yeah. You have an interesting note here that you're you're making a poor man's Bader VIP Barlow. So, what is a Bader VIP Barlow? First of all, well, you you have one, don't you? I I do. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. So why don't why don't you tell us? Because I've only I've only used it and not known I was using. Cause you had it in there a couple nights, and I've I've looked through it. It's it's a great Barlow, but I don't really know as much about it. But I think you can change the you you can change the magnification of the Barlow, correct? To a couple different magnifications, like usually. Barlow's are uh, 1.8x or 1.6x or 2x or 3x. What kind of ranges do you get with with the VIP Barlow? So yeah, the VIP VIP is an acronym, and and the V is variable. I don't know what the other parts to that acronym stand for. Um, out of the box, it comes as a two times Barlow, um, but like many Bader things, it is all modular. So like the and it's all T2 threading. So the Barlow itself um, is in the nose piece of this thing, and it just unscrews from the body of the Barlow. And then there's a bunch of 10 millimeter spacers, I think, or is it 15 millimeter? I'd have to measure. There's Mm. two of those. And then there's a, and and you, again, you can unscrew each one of those and remove just one or remove both. Um, And then at the top is a inch and a quarter eyepiece holder um, that I think can uh, accept like a, uh, like a DSLR camera adapter. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea here is that if you want to have a Barlow uh, that's less than two times, you just start to remove some of those spacers. Um, and like their Bader Hyperion eyepieces, I think you can just screw the Barlow element right into the bottom of those eyepieces. Um, and you achieve a very low powered Barlow. Um, but if you wanted to say go three times or even 20 times, if you really wanted like a extreme Barlow, you just add more of these T2 spacers in there uh, and that increases the length from your eyepiece to the Barlow lens. And as you increase that length, that's the magic formula for Barlow magnification. It increases the magnification. So, um, you know, beta cells, spacers or whatever. So I've got a couple that I, I think I can go from, you know, whatever kind of like one point, you know, small number times all the way up to over three or four times with it. Hmm. Um, but it is, it is like you and I talk about like that kind of futz factor or the, you know, the, the messing around at night, it's not really like, you know, don't, don't buy this Barlow thinking that you're going to change, you know, from three times to two times to four times in the course of a night. Um, at least I wouldn't recommend it because you're, you know, you're having to unscrew this thing and add or remove spacers, screw it back together, just a pain in the butt for the most part, in my opinion. Um, so it basically, you know, stays at two times and I barely ever use this thing, uh, just cause I don't use Barlow's very much. Um, the reason I bought this was I have that like a Ashfiric zoom that, um, like a number of people on cloudy night said the ultimate combo is to pair that zoom with this Barlow. 
And then you get this huge range of focal lengths and it works really well. And that's true, but you know, that Barlow is a tall Barlow and that eyepiece is a tall eyepiece. And it really creates uh, a lot of stress on your diagonal. Um, and I don't know, I, I just never really appealed to me because it really changes your observing position. Um, it, it just added a bunch of factors that I didn't like. So, but anyway, that's the Bader VIP. Tell me about your, your poor man's VIP that you're making. Well, I was, I was doing some digging around. And so I own a really, in fact, it, the, my very first accessory that I ever bought to go with a uh, telescope was a Teleview 2X, which is really a 2.1X Barlow. And I was reading around on, on Cloudy Nights, and a lot of people say that the 3X Barlow works really well with the Dr. 12 and a half, which I own, which would give me around 185 power. But I know that I wouldn't be able to use 185 power that much. Like I'd be able to use it maybe on 25 or 30% of the nights, but which is enough. And, you know, it's not really that expensive. And I was kind of like hemming and hawing over whether I'd, I'd get it or not. And then I, I did some more digging and found out that if you actually take the old um, Teleview uh, 2 or 2.1X and you put it on the tube, like you take the 3X uh, lens off of the, off of the uh, 3X, you, you swap those around, then the, the 3X body with the 2X lens gives you two and a half power, which would give me just under 150 power which I think I can use on half or maybe 60% of the nights. And then if I just want to, to go to 125, I can just use the 2.1X. So there might be nights where I want to use both uh, 125 and 150, but the nights at 185 are going to be less so. So I can probably, you know, there would be some futzing around the field, but you're only taking um, two lenses and you're only kind of passing them back and forth. And they they thread and unthread kind of like a filter. So there's there's not nearly the futzing involved as with a VIP. And I already own one of the Barlows. So just buying another one of the Barlows, um, I think they're around like 160 bucks Canadian, um, isn't really going to break the bank. And I know that 3X, even if my experiment doesn't work that well, the 3X works really, really well with the Dark Dur. And then people are saying, the people that have tried this say that, Actually, the very best combination is the 2X on the th- with on the 3X length in the 3X cylinder. And they say that that two and a half power, they say that that outperforms the power meet 2.5X. So, oh. so I kind of, I like that because, well, so I'm probably not going to use the higher end of that as much, but I would use the lower end uh, a little bit more. And the cost of doing it is actually, uh, well, pretty affordable because so, kind of breaking it down. Um, I have quite a few eyepieces, but I always find that uh, I only want to have like a few eyepieces in the field with me and you end up using a lot of the same powers, but then sometimes I just want to go up power or, or whatever. And I don't want to end up lugging all of these eyepieces out with me. I just want to take like a selection that, and I hadn't bought an eyepiece in a long time. And then two years ago, I bought this doctor because I think I, I'd heard whispering that they might go out of business or something or stop making them and they, they end up stop making them. I think doctors still in business, but they don't make eyepieces anymore. Um, so I bought that one. It was, I bought it on sale for $600, the most expensive eyepiece I own. Um, and then I'm like, well, you know, I really should, I really should be borrowing it just, just to get the, the cost per use down on it because it's a, it's a pretty expensive eyepiece and it works so well. Like, it just works amazingly well. There, there's no other eyepiece that's like it. And everybody's eye is different. It seems like people fall into uh, one of two camps. Seems like about 70 or so percent of the people that get it or look through it love it. And the other 30 percent don't. Um, I think it has to do with your eye and the type of telescopes that you're using. It seems to work better, I think, in more like the spotting scope type telescopes, which is kind of what I like to use. And you know, that works pretty well with me and them for people with long eye relief too, or need it because they wear glasses works, works well like that. So, yeah, so that's, that's my plan. I'm going to try to get one of these Barlows and, uh, and kind of mess around a bit and hopefully get this, uh, get this going, uh, for the summer so that I can kind of have all those different powers, just like, like the idea. So basically I could just take out my low power, like a 40 millimeter or my 30 millimeter, or maybe both. And then the, the doctor, 
and then have just these two Barlows. So I really, really, I could go out with two eyepieces and two Barlows and I would have um, around 20 power. I'd have 60 power, 125 power, 150 power and 185 power. Then I also have a one point time, 1.6 times Barlow, which gives me, um, I think about 30, or 35 power and then a hundred X. So I get, I get pretty much everything within about maybe 15 to 20 magnification all the way from about 20 X to 185 X. So that's sort of the, the right power for all occasions. Um, if you ask me, except for like super high power and that that's really anything above 185 power. I'm probably not using to look at deep sky objects with that's pretty much planetary only on a four inch. So I think that's going to have me covered. Hmm. Sounds pretty cool. And, um, kind of interesting that you've, you've, uh, I don't know, um, not probably just about every episode we talk about Barlow's up until this one, uh, you've mentioned, and we both mentioned how we don't really enjoy using them just cause you know, you got to mess around too much, but now you're, you're kind of going back to the Barlow's. So that's cool. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, that's sort of the fun of it, you know, expressing opinion, mm-hmm. I'm happy to go back on, you know, what, what I've said and, uh, you know, uh, as well to, to kind of go in a different direction. That's sort of part of the fun of it, you know, and, uh, and as well, like I just couldn't quite, I couldn't quite find the eyepieces that I was looking for to give me those mm-hmm. powers. So, so my opinion, I know there's lots of different eyepieces out there, but I really couldn't find like a six millimeter that I really wanted. And I have the seven millimeter Pentax. And so I have something really close to that. And I have something really close to these other powers too. Um, when it boils down to it. But what, what I'm looking here is to do something um, a little bit different, just to kind of, yeah, just to, I'm really trying to streamline things down so that like when I'm getting ready and, and I want to observe that I'm, that I'm just observing. And that's like this whole setup is kind of like, well, like what's, what's the lightest, but biggest telescope um, that really shows me stuff in the stuff that I'd like to look at anyway, and can still do pretty wide field. And I can look at doubles or I can look at nebula and my opinion, that's the four inch by tack. And, uh, you know, I've got it set up with, with lighter and lighter rails and, and rings and carbon fiber on top of a lightweight wood tripod that can, that can take about three or four times the weight I'm putting up top. And I guess even more than that, I guess, yeah, it's about four times. So I'm putting about 11 pounds on top once, once it's fully dressed and, and this tripod does 44 pounds. So, you know, it, it's a good, it's a good setup and the whole thing, the whole thing only weighs with, with the tripod and everything. Um, I guess that, that would be about, uh, 19 pounds is the whole setup. All, all eyepieces, all mount, like everything is 19 pounds in a four inch refractor, I think is, is pretty amazing. So that, in my opinion, that's, that's still grab and go. Um, it's not the lightest weight setup, but I have other scopes for that. But anyway, that, that's sort of, what I'm doing there. Very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. So we had some feedback um, over Boy, the past week. We. <laughs> let, let me start with uh, some feedback that I received, which was um, about my, my microphone or my voice quality. <laughs> and it definitely was not good last week. So um, I've been struggling a little bit with some microphone distortion on some previous podcasts towards the, uh, towards the end of the episode. So Last week, we tried a different microphone and uh, it didn't sound very good. So won't do that again. But in case uh, people were wondering, that was why. And, uh, you know, we're, we're always trying to, to get this working as good as we can. And, uh, you know, once in a while, we'll probably hit a few stumbling blocks along the way. But um, that's, uh, that's mine. Now, yeah, someone thought some you were feedback. sick. <laughs> I was <laughs> yeah. like, no. Shane wasn't sick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm healthy, but, uh, just, uh, was using AirPods rather than a microphone and they just don't do very well. So not, not for what we're doing anyway. So yeah, no, no. So you had some feedback on the called well, called well observing list. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Someone wrote that, uh, yeah, they weren't very happy. They said, I hope the Patrick Moore haunts your telescope. <laughs> and another concluded wishing you perpetual clouds. No, I, I'm just kidding. I'm just no, kidding. It wasn't quite that harsh. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. It really wasn't, wasn't harsh at all. I should no. have. And I think what it comes down to is I, I should have clarified. So no, nobody said anything like that. People just said, 
um, oh no, you should, you know, there's, I think three or four people wrote and said, you should, you should give them a try and, and take a look for them and all that. And uh, yeah, I looked it up and there's, and there's about 75 or so objects that we can see from Canada and I've seen them all. (laughs) So, so I'm, I'm speaking from, from sort of that, that experience. And then, uh, and then, yeah, I was thinking about it since. And so there's, there's a couple things. So one, the one thing that I was thinking about is that there are some um, observers that I think uh, deserve recognition um, as far as exploring the the Southern skies, you know, uh, Nicholas Dillacai, who, and who who made a few of the uh, discoveries that that made their way onto Messier's list? Um, I believe M fifty five and and there's there's at least a handful of others, um, and then had also found like some some of the southern sky objects, um, and he was observing under really tough conditions with half inch telescopes, and then as well at like thirteen millimeters is what he was using, which which really only gives you about three times the uh, the light gathering ability of your naked eye alone, not, not even what our small binoculars that we were talking about the start of the show would give you. And I was always thinking, man, like that, that individual deserves more recognition. And uh, so I kind of, I, I think that's sort of part of it is, is that there are people that, um, that sort of went before us and, and, you know, we're working with very minimal equipment in tough situations and they were making some discoveries and, and he discovered 42 things. Some were asterisms, some were double stars, some were different things, some were deep sky objects. Um, but yet, th- that that's really not a not a not a well known, not not like a forgotten observer, but definitely not a, not as well known. And and there's others, I think as well. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, I observed most of Moore's list from Florida and Hawaii, um, getting getting the ones that are. Uh, a little bit below the horizon from here. So I, I got down into like Columba and then up down, I think there's some down in Puppas and that sort of thing. So I think, I think I have like nine or 11 left to go. So I guess maybe that's part of it is, yeah, I've kind of been sort of lazily working on the list, but I noticed this, this is what I'm coming around to is that um, I owned a copy of Stephen James Amira. Caldwell objects. And so I have, I have most of his books. The only ones I don't have is a Southern one and this one, uh, because I actually bought the Caldwell objects and I gave it away. I read it. I was like, I was working on them. And then I got frustrated because most of the objects were below the horizon. I realized it was going to be a long project and I was just going off in other directions. So I gave it away. And then when, when we were having these discussions, I discovered that he actually reissued the book uh, I think about four years ago Oh, with different observations in it. And I thought that is kind of interesting. So I bought a copy. <laughs> oh. Have you, did you receive it? I just, it just came. Uh, it's weird. Like since the pandemic, we now can get orders delivered on Sunday and uh, that that's sort of new for our area. And so, yeah, it just, I haven't looked at it because it, it arrived. Um, yeah literally right before I walked up to, to record with you. So it's just sitting downstairs. Um, but apparently he used, oh, I, f- I forget her name. I should know it. She has a lot of the asterisms um, in, um, in, in some of the star atlases by Ronald Stoyan. Um, anyway, the, the, she's, she's got the observations in there uh, for the call ball objects. So I'm like thinking, huh, that's pretty interesting. So I thought, well, uh, I'll pick it up and kind of, kind of take, take another, uh, breeze through and then, um, might get the opportunity here in a couple of years to go to the Southern hemisphere, it turns out. So, um, maybe, if, maybe if that opportunity pans out, then, uh, you know, then, then I can finally, finally make, make my way through that. But yeah, th- there's lots of observers though, that, uh, that were sort of those original discoverers, um, in the Southern hemisphere that, uh, that worked in in conjunction and, and independent of Messi as well. So, yeah, I, I kind of feel like some of those individuals haven't been um, as well highlighted as as other people like uh, like John Herschel and 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 some of those. So, um, yeah, that's that's just kind of my opinion. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> right on. We have um, an email. I really want to get to, I know we just have a few minutes, but I really want to get to, to reading this, this email sure, um, 
from from Jim. Do you want to do you want to read it? I just talked a lot there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so Jim, uh, he sent us a number of emails in the past, um, some really cool observing reports. And uh, he recently uh, sent, well, I, you know, this is probably two or three weeks old now because uh, we, we've been getting a lot of emails and, you know, trying to get through as many as we can in, in our episodes. But this one was pretty cool um, because he mentioned a utility trailer that is sort of a like an astronomy trailer. And uh, anyway, let's get into the email. So uh, hi, Shane and Chris. On a recent podcast, you were all or you all were discussing how some of Chris's students uh, don't quite comprehend how the night sky revolves and the views change throughout the year. Uh, I feel their confusion. I have never really comprehended the night sky movement either until I went to observe the Perseid meteor shower. Uh, I was sitting out under the sky in a zero gravity lounge chair, um, which you can get at Costco apparently, as well as other places. Um, inside my sleeping bag. And after a bit of observing the meteors, I would fall asleep, then wake up later, then fall, you know, asleep, then awake. Uh, each time I fell asleep and woke up, I could see the sky had rotated and all the constellations had shifted position. Um, given that the sun only washes out about two hours of the sky after any given night, um, I was able to see almost the entire set of constellations or uh, in brackets here, well, 22 of 24 hours worth anyway, uh, rotate over my head in a single night. Only then did I truly comprehend the motion of the celestial dome, um, how the far southern objects make little circles, how the ecliptic constellations rise on one side, uh, soar overhead, then set on the other side, and how the northern objects uh, just circle the polar star. Uh, probably up north, the best time to, of, of the year to try this exercise would be in the fall, uh, when the number of darkness hours increases uh, before it gets too cold to stay outside. Um, let's see here. Early spring would work, but it might be a little chillier. Or just come down to Texas, uh, he said. So <laughs> I, I do like that one. I, I would like to get down to Texas. Um, so that was uh, email one. And then I think, was there... Where was the mention about the uh, trailer? Was well, I didn't. I one? didn't put that in the notes because I, oh. I mean, going to be be a little bit short on on time. But and the other thing is, and I just just want to say a couple things about that email is that I just thought it was so such a beautiful and eloquent way to put it. And I've kind of had the same experiences as, as Jim has with being out and sleeping under the stars and kind of falling asleep and waking up and seeing the the constellations jump. And I've never had anybody else talk about that. I, I actually talk about that in my class all the time. And I feel like now Jim and I have this, this sort of really interesting um, uh, view that we share of, of the night sky. We, we've never met before and barely have communicated over email. Mostly Shane reads the emails and responds. And I just thought that was just, um, it just blew me away when I read that. And then the other thing is about his modified trailer. And I really want to see um, the modified trailer. But anyway, um, we should wrap it up here, Shane. I can see that uh, Clark is coming in and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have to just, uh, just do that. Okay. Well, thanks, Chris. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.